All right, this is Stacy Krim, and I'm with David Gwynn, and we are performing an oral history with Janet Joyner for the Pride of the Community Grant Project. Thank you for speaking to us today. Today is um, Wednesday, March 27th, 27th, 2019. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for speaking with us. Oh, I'm so happy to. So, uh, when did have you always lived in the Triad area? Well, um, most of my adult life, yes. I mean, I grew up in Low Country, South Carolina, which you can probably detect uh, in my speech as we go on and on. And I, I sometimes lapse into it. I don't know why. I mean, it's not anything I wanted to erase. It's just we have a sort of specific sound. Mm -hmm. Low Country South Carolinians do. Mm -hmm. And when did you move to North Carolina? Um, it would have been in the fall of um, uh, whew, 73, I think it was. I got my position at the School of the Arts teaching there, so I moved in the fall of 73. And what were you teaching at the School of the Arts? I taught French language, um, primarily to dancers and singers, and then I also taught a course of literature um, to general college students there. And what age range were you teaching at the School of the Arts? Uh, college students. College students. Okay. Um, and did you live in Winston, you've win lived in Winston-Salem since you moved here? Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when did you begin uh, to get involved with LGBT issues in the area? I think that was maybe in the mid-90s, um, there were some serious attempts at suicide by local youth um, who had been so bullied in the public schools, and the local Peace Flag chapter, which at the time was headed by um, Kitty Bowman and uh, Flora Asazi. And Flora and Jose Asazi have um, gay a pair of twin sons who were gay, and so they were concerned about what was going on in the schools and wanted to start um, a support group for gay youth um, who had been so harassed, and the parents were desperate. They were trying to find something, so we were able to um, find a, a local religious community that would give us a home and once a week have a meeting there, and that's when I first got involved. By that time I was retired um, mm -hmm. and so you know, I was somewhat known in the community um, not as a lesbian um, I, but just as you know for my contributions in the community as a teacher and families whose mm -hmm. children I had taught and that sort of thing um, the way one gets roots in a community. So people, um, people trusted you as a yes. figurehead in the community? Yes. I would say so. And were you uh, were you involved with PFLAG when it started in Winston Salem? No, okay. not at all. I've been pretty closeted all my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when did you come out of the closet? Well, obviously, I had to. I mean, I didn't do it in a big way, but obviously, doing this work, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that would bring me out. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a whole new uh, sort of territory for me as well. Mm -hmm. um, when you were working at the School of the Arts, did you feel that may have been a dangerous thing to do if it was now? Well, not real, not at the School of the Arts because there are so many gays in the arts. Um, and, you know, although it was never anything that I ever announced or said, but I had a partner and it was, you know, it was people who knew me knew who I was and who I lived with. Um, mm -hmm. And it was like that. It was never really a big issue. Mm -hmm. um, probably in a different institution where there's not a preponderance of um, gay people, uh, or even a, a preponderant number of gay people, that might have been an issue. I don't know, although I have colleagues all over the state who teach, you know, and so it just hadn't been an issue for me personally. Mm -hmm. But of course, it became personal as I became a public figure around, mm -hmm. you know, doing battle around this issue. So the School of the Arts was a very good environment to be. Oh, in. it was. Yeah. You know, uh, was a, a very healthy environment for me. Wonderful. 
Um, so how did you first begin to get involved? Did someone ask you to get involved or did you take yes. it upon yourself? Oh, no. No, I was asked. Uh, um, well, Flora Sazi, um, and I think it was Kitty Bowman too, I mean, they, they needed to start this support group for gay kids. And so they approached me, Flora did, um, and I said, well, yes. Um, and so I started meeting with them once a week. Um, the Unitarian Church here was very helpful. They provided a, a room for us to meet and adults on, um, on the premises so that if there was, and the police there in case there was ever any trouble. Um, and they couldn't have been nicer and more welcoming. And so the kids and I too began to feel a home there that was safe for this kind of support to take place. And was this the beginning of GLSEN or was this separate with PFLAG? Um, there wasn't yet a chapter of GLSEN in mm -hmm. Winston-Salem and I actually learned about GLSEN um, doing this work. Mm -hmm. um, I forget now, a woman from Greensboro. Um, I mean, parents of gay kids were very involved in that time in trying to figure out ways to help mm -hmm. them, uh, their children, and um, it, the whole situation. And so they were very active in trying to create organizations or find organizations, and that's how I found out about Glisten, mm -hmm. whose founder actually is from Winston-Salem, and right. I didn't know that, <laughs> Kevin Jennings. But so we met um, with those organizations, and I later was trained by them about how to go about um, changing policies that affect the public schools uh, and, and the climate on the ground where, um, you know, students have to go daily. Mm -hmm. And when you work with students and actually hear their stories about what they faced, there was no way I could not become involved. Could you give us some examples of the stories that you heard the students talk about their experiences? Well. Um, Generally, if well, that's all yeah, you can well, do. Well, yeah, I do. No, uh, I can remember one of the students who was really, really bright. Uh, Jacob, Jacob Hall, his name is. I don't know where Jacob is now, but at the time, um, he was just determined to change things on the ground in his school. He was very bright, he, you know, he knew what was going on in the country and there were a lot of school shootings that were happening back then that had happened because the, shooter, the, the shooters had been accused of being gay or were uh, bullied for being gay, whether they were or not. And that information was kept, kept from us, kept from the nation, not because people didn't want to talk about it, but they were afraid that it might encourage um, other possible shooters to do this sort of thing. So it was uh, out of a sense of wanting to protect against encouraging a reoccurrence of this kind of thing to happen, as I remember. Um, but anyway, uh, Jacob had found out about Glisten, and he was he was going to start a gay straight straight alliance on his campus, and he had all the material and the the instructions from um, from Glisten and about how to approach his school principal and things like that. And we had gotten Jacob and his friend um, Danielle Zender, I think her name was. I anyway. Um, that they had agreed to give us six months to try to prepare the school system for what was happening. They, they were totally unprepared for this, what was at that time an emerging population on their campuses. I mean, they, mm -hmm. they had absolutely no training, no, no experience in any of this. So uh, I, remember, um, I, I remember one principal that we actually visited once we had a team of adults who were working on this, we went to visit a principal and he told 
the student, well, if you're going to be gay, you should just expect to be beaten up. I mean, it's hard to believe that now, but that's where we were in the mid to late 90s. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, there was Jason, and I remember um, one kid who actually he barely could speak when he came to see us. I forget his name now. Um, but back when we actually had gotten enough um, uh, momentum behind getting the um, State Board of Education to pass a Stop the School Violence Act that actually did have specific language in it that sexual orientation would be included. Uh, in that bill, uh, once we had that going, um, <laughs> Eli, Eli Vernon was his name, and Eli said, well, I'm going to go to Raleigh too. <laughs> and so we took him with us. We thought it would be good for him to be able to voice, you know, mm -hmm. his experience to the legislators, and he did. Um, so <laughs> away he went. and. To see that kid who could barely speak, I mean literally hold his head up, look you in the eye, or barely speak, even four months before, lead the way to Raleigh and go in and speak to his legislators, it was just amazing. Which is kind of what it was all about. I mean you want, you want every kid to believe that he can be the best that he can be and then he can have a chance to do whatever he or she wants to do and that they can live and exist positively in their land. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's as simple as that. Yeah. So I'd like us to go back to that initial group you were okay. working with, with of, of children. Um, what was the age range and about how many were in that group? There were you know, in their early teens, I would say 13, 14, thereabouts, and we generally had maybe 8 to 10 mm -hmm. on a regular basis. And were these from multiple schools? Yes, different schools, and sometimes we had um, some folks from Greensboro bring their kids over. Mm -hmm. I'm, I remember the Stroops, um, their son. They brought their son over from Greensboro. This would have been in, I don't know, late 90s. Um, so it was, it was the children and the parents together? Right. Okay. Um, and what was a meeting like for that initial group? What sort of support did you offer? Well, you know, I, I don't really know, except we just let them talk and mm -hmm. introduce themselves and mm -hmm. um, and they could ask us questions mm -hmm. and, and it was a time to be a play, a, a, a time when they didn't have to worry about who they were. It was a safe place for them to come and mm -hmm. um, they would mostly talk. Mm -hmm. um, we'd have refreshments always. And we'd usually, I don't know, play a game or two, like um, bingo, or you know, we we provided an atmosphere where they could be a little bit carefree, but they could talk if they needed to, and they usually did. We had one kid who rode his bicycle from way the other side of town. He must have ridden a good. 10 miles on his bicycle just to get there. Uh, it, they had never had such acceptance, which makes you really, you know, heart sick to know that. Mm -hmm. And did all of the kids show up with their parents or were kids allowed to show up without parents? You know, I don't remember up. <sighs> Most of them, because they weren't yet driving, were brought by parents. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I, I, I don't really remember that specifically. I'm sure it, there had to be a way to do that. Mm -hmm. um, the kid who rode his bicycle, 
probably didn't have his parents' permission, but he wasn't refused mm -hmm. acceptance in our group. And always our minister was there uh, on hand if somebody needed something. What denomination was that? Uh, Unitarian Universalist here in Winston. Wonderful. So did um, you start working to develop GLSEN before or after the ACLU case? Um, the bullying case? Do you remember? I don't really remember that. We, I remember that we were already working with the young people by the time I found out about GLSEN and then, you know, I went and got training at GLSEN um, for uh, how you go about trying to make the situation better on the ground. I mean, yes, work with these young people because they needed it right then and there, but the problem was there need, a, a much bigger job of education needed to be done, you know, to our educators about this young population emerging in their schools and they were going to do things differently. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, that's how I got involved with GLSEN. Um, and, uh, you know, that everything grew out of that. So it all, it all um, starts with, first of all, you have these kids who need some help. You try to help them and then you realize a lot more needs to be done. It's like what is that tale about the starfish, you know, and doing them one by one? Right. Well, you need, the, something needs to be changed here and mm -hmm. it's the system. Right. Um, so did you do training for local schools on LGBT issues? Um, well, not me personally. Uh, that too is a very long history. This school system was very resistant. Uh, we eventually did get um, a Kevin Jennings who started GLSEN came down and um, agreed to do a training for the local um, school system. Um, and of course they hemmed and hawed and hemmed and hawed and they didn't want to even announce it. But finally, because we had gotten smart enough to realize that we needed the whole community and so we held a community forum at which point they did announce that they were going to allow their counselors to come to a training. If we hadn't had that community forum, I don't know really, but I, I largely suspect that they would not have, um, they would not have um, agreed to it. And by this time, the group or GLSEN were able to have documented incidences of bullying in the schools. Oh, right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, and how, when the schools were presented with that document, those documented incidences, how did the schools react? Well, as I remember, um, it was a long, a long, long issue. They, first of all, were sort of forced into surveying the conditions on their own campus through language surveys, and we had gotten smart enough to realize by enlisting the help of um, a professor at Wake Forest who was a, a specialist on diversity issues, um, how you, and, and language and what that revolves around um, to get the school system to agree to a survey of lang types of language heard and um, whether or not if there was adult present that would be dealt with. So the survey issue itself, once the school system had basically agreed to it, then it took several years for us to work out a series of questions that would be acceptable to them and interestingly enough um, <laughs> They wouldn't allow these questions to be asked of the children, but they would ask it to, uh, they, they would allow us, allow questions that their parents could answer. And the parents revealed that, yes, my kids are hearing this language. And so then the school system had a problem because they had to deal with it because their own 
uh, their, their own statistics showed that they had a problem. So um, I can't remember exactly when and where, uh, what steps followed that, but um, they attempted to not let the, the school system at that time attempted not to let the public know that there in fact had been shown in their own statistics that, what, that there was a problem and they were going to have to deal with it. So they brought in some woman from um, out of state person from some um, Christian ministries of some kind who was supposedly a former lesbian and they met off, <laughs> off campus sites downtown in a Presbyterian church and this is how they were going to resolve it. Well of course we had people in the school system who let us know that this was taking place and so we called one of our ministers and the minister called and asked if they could go and so then we went and it it was a farce. I mean well you know I I don't know anything about that woman or what she was attempting to do or whatever but it, it was clearly an attempt to not have to deal with this issue and then finally they did have to deal with it. Mm -hmm. By the time we get to that point though, um, I've been able to make other connections and get on, uh, I was appointed by the State Superintendent of Education to serve on the Safe Schools Committee, I think that's what it was called. Um, of the State Board of Education and I was there for five years um, serving in that capacity and then they finally did uh, put forth a bill um, which was defeated the first time around um, because of involvement from the religious right who found out about it but um, Anyway, through service on that committee and I was assigned to work with a, a, a really fine uh, woman who met with parents, took down their, you know, information and clearly by that time they knew they had actionable, ca I mean cases that would be actionable by law and they knew the seriousness of it. So that's how that became the real impetus then that got the legislature to act on uh, the School Violence Act and finally was what got it passed, I think, right. in 2009. Mm -hmm. So the committee you were on, the statewide committee, what was the LGBT representation like on that committee? Never had ever been any before I was there. So you were the the was, a lesbian. The lesbian. <laughs> well, I don't know. No. I don't think they even knew whether I was or not. Oh, okay. You know, um, as a matter of fact, I'm relatively sure they didn't because when I was test, I actually had to testify before. I think it was the North Carolina Senate Judiciary Committee, and um, at my testimony, after I finished at the very end. I, I said to them, you know, by the fact of coming here and coming out publicly as I am now doing, I don't feel safe. And that fear reverberates through my whole family system. And I mean, there was consternation in the room. Grown men throwing their pencils down and everything else. And one of them actually did try to hit me. And, and another senator, actually, he was a representative, I think, Lubke, deflected the blow. I was stunned. Paul Lubke from... Yes, Lubke, yes, Representative Lubke. Um, so he, he protected you from he the did. person who was going to hit you? Yeah. And I, I, I was just stunned. Mm -hmm. But that so, proved your point. Well, yeah, <laughs> it did, it did. <laughs> But I, for the first time I, under, I remember, you know, I'd, I'd never encountered anything like that. And um, back then it was, you know, I, I guess they hadn't, they just 
hadn't assumed that I was a lesbian. I guess I didn't look what they thought one looked like or <laughs> whatever, I don't know. But there are a lot of people who can, they say the word is past, you can't tell whether, they, they don't look at you and they can't tell whether you're a, a, a homosexual or a straight person. Um, and I, I never had to worry about issues like that. I mean, that's the first time I realized people who really look like they are gay, whatever that look is. I don't know, maybe it's being too butch as a female and too femme as a guy. I mean, you know, um, who knows? But that was the first time I ever actually realized, Lord, what that must be like. How desperate that must be to live like that every day of your life. And that was quite a, a jolt for me. And what was the date that you were confirmed in and that all happened? Was that in the early 2000s? Um, I'm going to, well, it was, I, it was probably early 2009 that I testified. So only 10 years ago? Yeah. Wow. Kind of hard to realize, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, so the um, this committee you were on. What was the size of the committee, and was the primary focus was the focus just safety in schools or LGBT? Well, safety? it's the Judiciary Committee. So okay. it was. If you're going to get a law passed, that law has to pass. Right. I mean, it, it it's sent to the Judiciary Committee to go through numerous hearings, and people go and speak to that committee. And I was just one of uh, a number of people to speak. There were other laws also being passed. This was not the only bill that that committee was mm -hmm. considering. So, um, you know, uh, but I was one of the most knowledgeable people at that time about what was happening to kids at school, mm -hmm. in, uh, public schools in North Carolina. So that's why I was there. How did you prepare what you were going to say? Um, to that committee for when you presented? Oh, well, I'm sure I spent hours at it. I don't know. I mean, I kept careful notes. Once I realized that this was not just about meeting with, you know, uh, some students from Winston-Salem, that this was a huge, big political campaign to get a law passed and to try to change conditions on the schools because in the schools, um, then I began taking careful notes of everything. Um, and by that time I had had training also by GLSEN in terms of how to have hard conversations, how to, you know, ask for what you need to ask for and find out who to go, who can grant what you need to ask for and, and that sort of thing. So. Um, I don't really rem I'm, I'm really sort of fuzzy now about all of that intricacy, but it was it was complex and I luckily on the DVD that I have given you all about this history when it was closer to the time those kinds of pieces of information are are there and I'm glad that that's down cuz my memory is not what it used right. to be and I but I I do remember that um I was scared that day, obviously, after that. It was my first real encounter with somebody who wanted to do me bodily harm. Mm -hmm. um, since you came out kind of later in your life, did that change how you interacted with the students who were being bullied since they were starting at a, to be bullied at a much younger age? Well, I don't, I never thought about that. Um, it was all such new territory. Um, I don't think it did. I mean, but you know, I'm me and I can't answer for them, but I, I think they trusted me um, and they felt like they finally had somebody who could understand that, you know, they, they weren't evil people. Mm -hmm. 
even though their churches had told them that, and sometimes their parents told them that. Um, but they could see that here was somebody who had led a pretty good life and got to do pretty much what she wanted to do. And so maybe, I, I don't know, but I, I think they certainly felt like I was in their corner, <laughs> so to speak. Do you remember any of the stories of um, the, that the children may have told you about coming out to their parents and what that was like? Do you remember, do you have any memories of any specific stories? Well, I actually do. There was one kid, um, a boy, he must have been 14. His parents actually turned him out of the house, wouldn't let him come home anymore. He was, he was living in his car. He had gotten jobs and bought himself a little car. He was living in his car, out of his car and going to various friends. But his parents just turned him out. Stunning, isn't it? Isn't that something the, that the parents could have had child services called on them? I mean, if the schools found out well, about that. Well, yeah, I guess. But nobody, I mean, who would have thought that? Mm -hmm. The kid didn't know what to do. And actually, I think we did get social services in on it. Um, event, I mean, that's, we contacted, we knew it was way beyond our expertise mm -hmm. at dealing with this. So we contacted social services, mm -hmm. I think, right away. And there were were there many cases like that where the well that was an obviously the worst time yeah. the worst one um, and the kids that got to come to us were kids whose families were not rejecting them but were they were just so worried about the the welfare of their own children and often it was not just their child but a sibling as well or their children's friends who you know, would be mistreated or attacked or whatever at school. I mean, so they were desperate to find some kind of resource for making it easier and safer for their own kids. And were there many incidences of violence against LGBT students in the Winston-Salem schools that were reported to you? Yeah, there were. What type of violence? Well, Lit cigarettes ground into a cheek, um, being kind of ganged up upon and pushed over an outstretched leg so that you would, you know, fall into the classroom or out of the classroom, um, being shut up in lockers or having your hand, uh, a locker door pushed against your hand. Um, causing real pain. I mean, those are some of the most outstanding ones that I remember. I mean, I'll never forget those. Or, um, um, I remember getting a telephone call like two or three o'clock in the morning um, because PFLAG had, uh, had published my number as a number to call if, for youth to call if they needed help. And being awakened, you know, in the middle of the night early one morning and this young girl who um, was calling to say she was, she didn't know what she was going to do, that her parents would allow her to go to school every day, but then when she'd come home they'd lock her in the room and she couldn't go out again and somehow she'd gotten a cell phone, you know, one of, back then there were those little flip flop things and she called me to say she didn't know what she was going to do and I tried to calm her down and say well now the first thing you need to do is go talk to your school counselor and she said well ma'am I already did that and this is what has happened. Uh, the counselor outed her to her parents and so that's when it became obvious that a really big job of training needed to happen of not only of school teachers but of school counselors and they're simply was nothing about this in the training of any of them at that time. Mm -hmm. So it, it became obvious it was a pretty big job that needed to be undertaken. Mm -hmm. 
And the students that you saw, what percentage were boys versus girls? Approximately. Approximately. Well, there were always a few more boys than girls. Mm -hmm. I think girls had an easier time of it. Boys have a much harder time, I think, because the stigma mm -hmm. of being a gay man was probably a whole lot worse than the stigma of being um, um, a lesbian. You know, um, that's just the masculine world, I suppose. Um, but anyway, the boys had a really hard time. And usually they were the least equipped to fight for themselves. Can you elaborate upon that? Um, you mean boys being the least equipped to fight for themselves? Well, <laughs> that you, you know, this is America. <laughs> I mean, you're a football jock or whatever. And if you, I mean, you play sports, you, there's this manly image. And if you transgress that, then the anathema of the tribe falls heavily upon you, especially in those formative teen years. I mean, and so of course mothers were terrified for their sons and fathers had a harder time even with their gay sons, I imagine, because of every bit of their own training and inclination. Mm -hmm. So. And if it hadn't been for Flora Asazi and her two gay twin boys, nothing would have ever happened in, in Winston-Salem. Not that their father didn't love them, he did, of course he did. Um, but it was a taboo subject back then, and this was the beginning of opening up to the diversity that is the human being. Mm -hmm in our little local area. Mm -hmm. And how would you say overall the climate for LGBT people in Winston-Salem at that time was? Well, it was, you didn't, I mean, you didn't want to talk about it. I mean, we had, there were enough professional gay people at that time. I'm remembering, um, Sometime about in the early 90s, or I'm not quite sure when it began, um, there was something called the um, the Business and Professional Guild. The Triad. The Business Triad Business, Business and Professional Guild, guild. Right. and that was a guild. It was a it was an association, a guild of grown professional people who were gay and lesbian. And we had a monthly meeting. We met uh, over at one of those places near the airport. We had a dinner and always a speaker. And um, there were just so many of us that were in the professions, medical, law, education. We'd had successful careers. And, you know, that's, it's around those people who were contributing members in their, com upstanding members in their communities that there began to be uh, this kernel of um, understanding, you know, that, that we belonged and people needed to know that. You know, we were teaching your children, we were healing your sick. I mean, so it kind of grew out of that exponentially. Mm -hmm. About how many people do you remember being or attending one of the Triad Business Guild meetings at a given time? Oh, Lord. I mean, it was huge. We filled up the dining room wherever it was. I mean, it was huge. <laughs> um, I guess I've wondered if, you know, I mean, I don't think the organization even exists anymore. We fell apart after a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were no many, there were no more 40 year olds who needed to do that. You know, they, they had their own lives and didn't need it. Mm -hmm. But it served a real purpose for a while. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a place for us to see who we were and what numbers and what we actually did in our communities. Mm -hmm. And did that meeting create like a close-knit network? Oh, absolutely. 
Absolutely. Um, and would you say that the communities in Greensboro and High Point and Winston-Salem and Burlington were fairly interconnected? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, it was, and, the, and, and it represented um, a good deal of power in these communities as well as money. Mm -hmm. What were some of the upper level power brokers in the Triad Business Guild? What did they do? You don't have to give their names, I don't, but just do you remember some of the positions? Well, they there held? were, I mean, certainly in law, there were a lot throughout the law offices of um, our area, um, Piedmont Triad. Um, they were in real estate, they were in, um, a lot of them had their own businesses, um, certainly in medicine, uh, the med schools, uh, and the teachers in the med schools. So many of them were professionals. And um, once, I mean, I, I, really, I don't know. I'm sort of out of. I've forgotten all of that, or I'm out. Of, but it was, it was, um, it was a group of people that had standing in their communities, power within their communities, and would know who to go to speak to to get things done if things needed to be done mm -hmm. in some way, and were often people that other people came to to help solutions of problems. Mm -hmm. So it was a true business and professional guild. Um, I don't really re know much about the businesses other than education, medicine, um, and law. Mm -hmm. A lot of professional people. Um, were these members triad natives or did many of them move into this area? Well, I, you know, I don't really know. I do know that of my own friends, they had come from um, the Northeast, uh, New York, uh, Florida, uh, but it was mainly southeastern, mm -hmm. I would say. Did you get a sense of that the people who moved here moved here because it, they perceived this as an LGBT friendly area already? Or was it simply because of business or in their profession and then they found the community later? The latter, I think, most probably. I mean, this was not known as being, you know, wildly liberal area in that regard. I mean, it's and it remains today very conservative. So, I think they they found their way here for whatever reason, jobs and so forth. And then once here, needed mm -hmm. to have a way to find each other, and that's what they did. Okay. Um, so moving on to the ACLU case. Now remind me, which one are we talking about? Because I did a prayer case. Oh, well, a, we can talk about all of them. Well, <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't know what's... Uh, what was the prayer case? Oh, that's... <laughs> yeah, we don't need to go there. It was like <laughs> going to the... Um, the uh, oh, county... Um, meetings of the Forsyth County commissions, and they'd always open with a Christian prayer. And it, um, so some members of my church said, you know, this doesn't seem very right. So, you know, the local ACLU chapter said, no, it isn't right. So we brought a prayer case and, you know, we won at certain levels and for a while they, had to quit using just a Christian prayer. Um, and then there was a case somewhere else, I think in the Northeast, that was very like ours, and that case lost. So then they went back, I suppose, to doing all the all-time Christian prayers. I don't know, you know, it's, it was a kind of a moment in my life. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, people thought, well, we'll get Janet. She knows how to get things done. and, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it doesn't have anything really to do with 
gay youth. Right. So was was religion a major stumbling block? Oh, always, always. I would not a certain interpretation or um, what is you know loosely known as the religious right took took it upon themselves to you know fight this battle always um, and that got very intricate and you know we fought and fought and fought for years and there was this stuff about the eight texts and the Bible and you know and and then the scholarship that followed after that began to prove that well that wasn't going to stand up either because our understanding of what that meant was really wrong so it was really about exploitive sex is what the Bible is all about and and it was important for us to tell young people and for them to know that it it wasn't who you love but how you love you know those, those are the issues always I mean it seems to me so you did a lot of outreach with uh, schools to help them um, understand children did you do any outreach to religious organizations in the area well actually um, it was more with churches to begin with and and the battle with the schools they never really wanted to certainly to have anything to do with our organization um, but they did understand finally that they had to um, educate themselves but that was only because of the work that I did in Raleigh on that committee for five years when they finally realized they've got lawsuits you know just ready and we would have had a very important one here in North Carolina except for the fact that the woman whose daughter had been so severely bullied that she had to send her away to a school in Texas for gay people high school in Texas that she found out about but if she had brought suit she she didn't want to do that because she worked for the very school system in which this happened and she was afraid for a job so but the people at the state level certainly did realize the seriousness of that and that in fact is how we um, did get the law got a chance to to have the committee uh, draft a law and go to the Judiciary Committee with it that mm -hmm. actually did change things and get sexual orientation enumerated in the bullying, the anti-bullying bill mm -hmm. that, that finally passed. Um, right. Long, long history that most of which I'm kind of, uh, I don't remember very succinctly now, but mm -hmm. um, moments stand out. You're doing a great job. <laughs> well, you know, I, it happens when you're an octogenarian, the world changes a little bit. You kind of say, well, what did I come in this room for? I don't quite remember. Maybe if I go back to wherever it was that I was, <laughs> I can remember when I come back down here. And that's how my mind is working now. I don't, you know, I know I'm kind of foggy. Mm -hmm. So, um, what other court cases do you did you work on? Um, did you work on other ACLU cases? No, that's been the only one. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so, when about when did um, the Winston Salem chapter of Glisten form? Do you remember? Well, it would have been um, in that mid ninety period when we were first. I think I worked as the co the female co-facilitator for a couple of years and then realized, oh man, this is much broader than just helping these individual students here. Um, and we, we knew we had a much larger job on our hands, a huge education job. Um, so I'm going to say um, maybe about 97 or 98 somewhere in then the late 90s mm -hmm. and how many um, facilitators were there or how many people were in the organization who operated it um, you mean the glisten the, the, the local glisten chapter yes oh well I'm real foggy about that um, I think I founded the chapter and mainly the people who worked with the youth because there was um, Thomas Farmer 
and Joe Foster and Wendy Scott uh, were people who took over facilitating that group of youth, the meetings with the youth. So there were probably about a half a dozen of us who were, at the time, um, the prime movers, mm -hmm. those that I named. Mm -hmm. And was um, when you became a formal organization, a uh, formal chapter of GLSEN, was there any pushback in the community? No, I don't think, I mean, only, no, um, other than that the superintendent of schools decided this was not an organization that he cared very much for. Mm -hmm. And um, at the time, there was hardly any other national organization working on these issues. So that's why he hired the, quote, former lesbian minister to come in and instruct his staff. Did you uh, did, were you able to attend that that forum with the uh, the uh, former lesbian minister? <laughs> the reform I, you know, to lesbian. I think I would remember that. I think I did. Okay. I'm not, or or maybe some of my um, other people who had worked close with me did go in. I think I decided maybe I opted not to because that would have cued. Don, the then superintendent, if he he would he knew me, mm -hmm. and so if he saw me, he would have done something to get us out of there. So I think I opted not to go in and and listen to her. Uh, so I sent in some people who he who he wouldn't know. <laughs> Your spy network. <laughs> Did, what, do you remember anything they reported back? I'm really just fascinated with the idea of a reformed lesbian minister, so I'm wondering how she was going to facilitate whatever she was trying to do. <laughs> you know, no, I really, there was a whole article in the newspaper here, it was blown all up, all of everything, and um, I mean, in my humble opinion, she was ridiculous, <laughs> the claims that she made, but you Do know. you remember some of those claims? No, I don't. <laughs> She was a blip mm -hmm. on my scale. <laughs> um, but, um, well, very risible even then. Mm -hmm. That I do know. Mm -hmm. I mean, that I do remember. So, but <laughs> And I think it was a moment that uh, the superintendent would wish to forget because he looked pretty stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how long from you founding GLSEN in Winston-Salem were you active at the organization? Well, maybe close to 10 years, I think. Maybe, I don't know, maybe slightly less than that. So to about 2010, 20, 2009, uh, I'm, I'm going to say by the time we get to 2010, I'm pretty much done mm -hmm. with that or somewhere 10 or 11 around in those years because I had retired a little bit early because I'm a writer and I'd wanted to finally have time to to write, mm -hmm. um, and I could never really do that successfully and teach. I mean, just teaching took all my time. Mm -hmm. um, but then I graded my papers carefully, and you know, I was just, anyway, in order to be able to write, I needed time. So I retired early, as soon as I could, and have spent these years, other than, I mean, it took another dozen years before I actually got around to having time to write again. Um, but all of that has informed my life and made me a richer poet, I think. Mm -hmm. So you write poetry? Yes. Wonderful. Um, and it's influenced by some of your experiences. Oh, I mean, isn't everything, yes. <laughs> you know, yes. But um, my third book will be coming out in the summer and I have a fourth ready to go to the editor who wants first refusal. So. Mm -hmm. I finally got around to doing what I wanted to do. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's great. Um, so in your time with Glisten, how did you see the climate in the area and the 
the young people you were working with change? Well, that's a, that's a really good question because the last time I actually um, engaged with or got to see the youth that were coming to meet regularly, there's no longer such a meeting. They don't need to do that. I mean, I think there may be gay straight alliances in many of the schools now. Um, but when I saw them, um, you know, it wasn't a question of slashing wrists and doom and gloom and all that sort of stuff. They were wanting to, can we go, can we rent a movie or can we go bowling, you know, all these. They were doing normal teenage things and they just seemed to me a lot healthier and a lot happier. Mm -hmm. So. And did you have any transgender young people while you were working with Glisson? Not, I, n not in my own experience personally as young kids. I, that simply wasn't on our horizon then. Only in the adult world, in the business and professional guild, had I even come to realize there was such a thing and knew a transgendered person. Um, but that's become a whole nother, you know, whole nother issue. And I, you know, this business about bathrooms and all that stuff, and I was like, oh boy, I'm not wise enough to know how, you know, what this, how to even go about um, resolving if one can or coming up with stuff. I think, you know, the quicker my generation dies out and the young people <laughs> take over, the better off we'll all be because they, you know, they just know how to handle all of this. Mm -hmm. They really do. They haven't yet been so cemented in a culture that just will not move. And, uh, you know, I have great, great hope in their ability to truly um, revere diversity. Because I think that's something that older generations don't have an easy time with. They may, okay, I gotta let this be, but I'm not happy about it deep down inside. And I think um, the younger generation really does actually cherish it. And you know, that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Um, other than that, I remember it was really nice that, I mean, I'm the first person in my family to ever go abroad that I know of, uh, you know, for generations. And uh, we've been here about 12 now. Um, who knows what those first people were running from or hoping to establish. But anyway, they came to South Carolina and parts of North Carolina early on in this 1600s, the late 1600s, and um, I think that um, community is what it really is about, and by that, I mean, you know, sitting down and eating with people and talking with people and genuinely sharing with people. And once, once you do that, it's hard to not see them as human beings. And that somehow developing community, genuine community is, is where the answers lie. But I remember that um, about the bathroom issue, in the early 1960s, when I was first in France, first of all, uh, most restaurants didn't have public toilets, or those that did, they only had one. And, you know, I'd never really been to the same toilet as where a man would go. I mean, not together, but there was one stall. That was it. I, and in French, the word for toilet is called les toilettes, which is a plural term, but it isn't plural. It's just one toilet and it's just one hole surrounded of course by a little room but down there where the toilets were where the toilet was was always 
a little old lady dressed in black and she usually had a little broom, a little rag, and she was there maybe to reassure the females who were for the first time going to use public toilets in France. I mean, this it was a new thing. And um, I was trying to remember if that person, if that job description had a name and I couldn't remember it. And so I was asking, I have friends in France and, and Switzerland um, and um, asked them about this position, this job description. And, and they all said to me, and every time that I asked them, well, no, we just called her La Dame Pipi. <laughs> so that is child talk. You know, there's bound to be another name, but no. Even in the French culture, she's called La Dame Pipi. <laughs> and I was thinking, you know, really, we ought to be able to solve where people go to the bathroom. And, you know, I don't know what it's like in men's rooms, but I know in, men, in women's rooms, uh, there's a stall, and you can lock the stall. And, you know, I just, you don't have to, there's nobody else in there with you, I guess, unless you let them in. So it seems to me that we spend an awful lot of time stirring people up, trying to you know, brew up fear where none really should exist. And so, I, you know, that issue, I, can, you know, I, I don't know. I don't have anything to add to it. But that's why I say bring on the young people. They just deal with it. <laughs> <laughs> so in your career working with LGBT youth, what are you most proud of? Well, I'm most proud of getting the, um, the anti-bullying bill passed that includes specific language. And not that, you know, not that passing bill stops bullying or harassment or anything totally, but what it does do is it gives the professionals on the ground a bill to back them up when they want to intervene for inappropriate language or things that they see. We had it for race and for religion, and now we have it for sexual orientation as well, and, I'm, and, and for disabilities. And so I'm proudest of getting that accomplished. Excellent. And is there anything you would like to talk about that we haven't talked about in the interview already? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad I could hang on to the end of it <laughs> and not wander too far afield, which is what I tend to do these days. It reminds me of something that reminds me, and I'm, I've turned into my mother. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much for speaking with us today. Well, thank you. It's been a pleasure for me, and thank you for your work. <laughs>